What makes something addictive is that it releases dopamine in the brain's reward pathway. Traditional drugs, like drugs and alcohol, are more ubiquitous, more available, more potent than ever, more, you know, more forms of delivery than ever. And then we have drugs that didn't even exist before. Okay, Anna, welcome to the summit. Um, to get started, so you've just published a book called uh, Dopamine Nation. Could you maybe tell us a little bit about this book and why did you feel it was important to write this? You know, what motivated you to want to put this knowledge out into the world? The book is a culmination of 20 plus years of psychiatric practice and also a hypothesis about why we're seeing increasing rates of depression, anxiety, suicide, and general despair correlating with wealth of nations, the richer the nation, the more unhappy people seem to be. And what I do in the book is I, I draw parallels between people with severe addictions who get into recovery and the types of wisdom that they, as a matter of survival, uh, acquire uh, in their lives as part of their addiction recovery. And I suggest that that is a wisdom that we could all benefit from, whether or not we're struggling with a severe, typical type of addiction. Um, because the hypothesis is that the reason that we're all so unhappy is not because of trauma or loneliness or social dislocation or poverty or many of these other um, putative causes, which are all important and probably play a role. But you know, my hypothesis is that the real reason we're all so unhappy is because we're living in this world of incredible overabundance and we're stressing our brains because we are uh, getting too many dopamine hits. And the only way that our brains can compensate is to essentially downregulate our own dopamine production, putting us into what is akin to a, a depressive state. And the reason that's really important is because the intervention looks very different if that is the cause of our suffering. Um, you know, if the cause of our suffering is, is, is trauma or, or, or any of these other uh, types of, uh, you know, uh, possible causes, well, then the intervention is something looks something like processing your trauma, um, you know that that sort of thing. But but if the the real cause is that we're just constantly um, pleasuring ourselves and in essence titillating ourselves to death, then then it's a very different intervention than, than the intervention is that we need to uh, you know live in the world differently. We need to abstain from. Uh, highly reinforcing drugs and behaviors, which are ubiquitous. And we need to actually actively invite pain into our lives in order to uh, be in balance with our, you know, how our brains were intended uh, to, to be in balance with, with the world and, and in nature. That's, that's so interesting and very counterintuitive to, to a lot of what you hear in the, in the psychology world these days. Um, I'm just curious, Anna, you know, what was, what was the sort of pathway that led you to, to, this, to this hypothesis? And whenever the sort of, I suppose, the penny dropped for you, how has this changed? How did that change your own approach to life, you know, before and after? I'm just curious about that. Yeah, so I think one of the key pieces was just learning more about how the brain processes pleasure and pain, learning, you know, that in fact, pleasure and pain are co-located in the brain and work like opposite sides of a balance, that there's this opponent process mechanism such that with any pleasure, we experience its opposite transiently, uh, which is to say we experience pain or a come down before going back to a level balance. And that with repeated exposure to highly reinforcing drugs and behaviors, we essentially go into a chronic dopamine deficit state. So the neuroscience was really influential for me. But another key piece was, you know, in the last 20 years, the U.S. has endured and is still in, enduring a tragic opioid epidemic in which people with severe chronic pain have, have been, and, and other types of pain uh, have 
have received opioids from their doctors, and many of them have become addicted to those opioids and or uh, diverted those opioids knowingly or unknowingly to others who have become addicted and died. And what, what was really fascinating to me is that um, people with severe chronic pain who take opioids daily will initially experience relief from their pain, but over time, the opioids will stop working and then can even make pain worse. So that's really fascinating, right? Like, how is it that something that was intended to and initially relieved suffering became, you know, a contributor to suffering? And yet we, we know that this is a real biological phenomenon. It's called opioid-induced hyperalgesia. And people who are on opioids for long periods will actually not only have worsened pain in their original site of injury, but will begin to experience pain in other parts of their body where they never had injury. And the reason for that is because of the way that we are hardwired to adapt to any increase in dopamine and to change our brain as a result to try to get back to this baseline uh, homeostasis such that the brain compensates for opioids by essentially going into, you know, in involuting opioid receptors, uh, decreasing, you know, endogenous opioid production, the opioids that our own body makes. So we're out of balance effectively. And then the merest pain, you know, the merest injury becomes a source of pain. And to me, that just analogizes like everything about our lives now, you know, from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed, we're constantly changing the way that we feel to avoid pain uh, and to pursue pleasure, which by the way, is how we evolved over millions of years of evolution. There's nothing wrong with us because of that. That's nature. The problem is the world that we live in now, uh, where we have at the touch of a finger, really infinite, infinite pleasures. And, and so we're, it's, it's a mismatch between the primitive wiring and our modern ecosystem. It makes a lot of sense. And, you know, you've, you've briefly touched on it there about, you know, the evolutionary basis for this mechanism. Could you maybe tell us, you know, why this might have been adaptive for us in our evolutionary past in an environment where there were scarce resources, but now, you, you know, there's a, there's a mismatch there. For most of human existence, we have lived in a world of incredible scarcity where we have had to labor every day, walking tens of kilometers, you know, paying attention to every possible threat in the environment huddling together, you know, naked, cold, and afraid uh, just to survive. And that's been true for, you know, the 99.999% of human existence. But what has happened in the last 200 years is that through technology and innovation and advances in science, all of which have brought many good things, we've essentially transformed that world into a world of overwhelming abundance where we're insulated from pain, we're insulated even from the merest discomfort. It could be that childbirth and sex are maybe the only remaining experiences left to us where we are physically, uh, you know, spontaneously in our bodies uh, unless we otherwise, you know, choose to make it so. Um, and we have this incredible access to highly reinforcing drugs and behaviors. And what makes something addictive is that it releases dopamine in the brain's reward pathway Traditional drugs like drugs and alcohol are more ubiquitous, more available, more potent than ever, more, you know, more forms of delivery than ever. And then we have drugs that didn't even exist before, right? Like video games, like online pornography, uh, like shopping on Amazon, like social media, uh, online investing, you know, it's all become gamified, drugified. So that essentially almost everything we do now has been made addictive, even work, you know, which now is 24 seven, or I mean, I, I personally, and this is true for many physicians in the United States, I get a graph every month telling me whether or not I've hit my billing targets. You know, if it goes below the billing targets, I get anxious. If it goes above, I get a little hit of dopamine. And, and essentially what that potentially leads to, if we're not really thoughtful about it is the commodification of our human beings as patients, because they're now a vehicle for me to meet my targets and not really um, a person that I'm trying to heal. You know, so potentially that's that's the conflict. 
Hundred percent. So this this particular you know this summit is really aimed at mental health professionals, therapists, people that work one on one with people like you do yourself. Um, so I think it would just be important to cover, Anna. Um, why is this important for someone at home listening that's a bit skeptical, thinking why is this important for mental health professionals to be aware of how dopamine works in the in the brain and body? It's really important because we are seeing more and more people coming in with chronic pain conditions in the absence of any identifiable physical injury or illness. We're seeing more and more people coming in in different states of despair who don't have any clearly identifiable injury, psychological injury, trauma-wise. They have loving parents. They have strong social network. They have every form of privilege in, in terms of access to um, you know, healthy activities, um, elite education, they're financially uh, safe and in many instances privileged. And yet, and yet they are struggling, right? And on top of their despair is guilt because they recognize on some level that they have it all and, uh, you know, should be happy and aren't. So I think um, it's really important to shift the frame and recognize abundance and overabundance as a source of human stress, pain, and suffering, and to understand how that works in the brain. And then to reframe that for patients and say, I appreciate that you are coming here for anxiety, insomnia, depression, et cetera. But instead of giving you an antidepressant or you know, engaging in some deep exploration uh, to try to figure out what your trauma is, not to say that those things are not indicated, you know, sometimes they are, but what I've found is that sometimes that very initial intervention by just asking them to engage in a dopamine fast where they eliminate their drug of choice, whatever it is for a period of time to reset reward pathways, often that alone um, will substantially alleviate the suffering. And then there's that moment of, <clears throat> wow, okay. Uh, you know, my, my suffering isn't because I have a brain disease uh, per se. It's because the way that I'm living is not how my brain evolved uh, for my body and my brain. And so I need to create a world within a world in order to flourish in a world of overabundance. It's, it's so interesting. And just what you're saying there about how you, like not only do you have the anxiety and the depression um, now you, but you've also, you know, if you're in that situation where you do come from a place of privilege and you're experiencing that, there's the, the guilt and the shame around, you know, I should have everything, but I feel terrible. What's going on? You know, so right. this would really help explain that, you know, that really makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I think your own story, Anna, is really illustrative here because it sort of, it shows that it it's not necessarily an addiction to substances. There's something going on here. There's a, there's a very basic mechanism at work here that can be linked to almost any behavior, would you say? So maybe if you could briefly tell us about your own, your own story. Um, sure. Yeah. I'm that happy would be to. interesting. I think. Yeah. So that was sort of a, another kind of aha moment. So, you know, in, you know, around age 40 ish, um, you know, I had everything and more that I had ever dreamed of in my life. I had a supportive and loving husband, who I love and am attracted to. Uh, I've got these great kids. I've got a, a fascinating job, um, you know, patients that I enjoy seeing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and yet what happened to me was that I essentially developed this modest behavioral addiction to romance novels. I like to joke that Twilight was my gateway drug, but it actually was. Um, I had for whatever, I've always been a reader, but for whatever reason, never read in the romance genre until like age 40. Uh, another mom at my kid's school said, oh, you've got to read this book, you know, vampire romance novel. She joked that she had looked for the sequel in the adult section, couldn't find it and asked the bookseller, why not? And they said, well, that's because it's over in the teen section because it was written for teenagers. But there clearly was this phenomenon where middle-aged women were reading vampire romance novels. And I, I did too. And for me, it just, it was my drug of choice. It absolutely transported me. It accomplished that thing that people, you know, in my practice for years have talked about people addicted to alcohol who say, I knew from the first sip, you know, that this was going to be a thing that I was, I was going to, I was going to use. It just worked like nothing else kind of 
transported me, you know, outside of my body and outside of my life into this fantasy world where I could forget everything. And uh, so I went from Twilight Saga to reading all the other vampire romance novels or many of the other ones. Um, but it still was, you know, manageable as a hobby. It really got out of control when I got an e-reader, I got a Kindle, and then all of a sudden now I could read anything without people knowing what I was reading. So there was that level of anonymity or what we call the double life. Um, you know, I, I could read anywhere, anytime. I could, as soon as I was done reading, get another book on Amazon. I could get free books on Amazon of very poor quality. But as time went on, what happened was I developed tolerance to the romance symbols that I needed more potent forms to get the same effect, which is part of the natural progression of addiction. Then I was looking for more graphic forms, you know, more graphic sex scenes, and eventually just progressed to frank erotica that I was reading all the time. So when I wasn't working or I wasn't, you know, doing the bare minimum for my family, I was reading romance novels and it's all I wanted to do. Uh, and other rewards that had given me joy previously were no longer rewarding. So that kind of narrowing of focus mm. where we then get into that dopamine deficit state and we don't see it happening as it's happening, but importantly, the other things become more sal uh, less salient, right? Less rewarding, less salient, very focused on just getting our drug, using our drug, hiding our drug use. Um, and that's what happened to me. I mean, I think, you know, sort of the, the low point for me was when I actually started to bring, bring uh, these novels to work and I would read between patients. And I just wanted to, I just wanted to be done so that I could read, you know, so it was like not that different from stashing like a little flask, you know, of vodka or something in my drawer and, you know, taking sips between patients. Um, yeah. So that's what happened to me. And um, I, I was like, Oh, and it was really only when I was uh, doing an exercise with some of my psychiatry trainees around, you know, how to ask patients questions about their drug and alcohol use. And we were one student short. So I took the student role with, I paired up with another student and uh, you know, the question is like, is there a behavior uh, that you'd like to change? And so, because I was in the student role, I thought, well, I'll, I'll mention the reading because I'm doing some late night reading two, three in the morning, um, you know, that I'd like to change. I didn't go into detail about what I was reading, like totally embarrassing, uh, but it was interesting because, you know, and then, you know, we walked through the exercise and the next day I found that having spoken it aloud to another human being, I couldn't then unsee it. And this is why a very early and important part of the intervention in clinical care is to just ask patients like, you know, are you using drugs or alcohol or digital drugs, online drugs in a way that is not congruent with your goals and values that you'd like to change? And just articulating that brings it into relief in a really powerful way that forces us out of that waking dream, which is such a, a telltale sign of addiction, where we have that divided mind and we're engaging this behavior, but we're, you know, as they say, in denial, we're not really allowing ourselves to see it and lying about it to others. So that was the beginning of, uh, you know, my journey of recovery in which I basically just, uh, you know, in my own life, did the things that I recommend for my patients <laughs> and, uh, you know, self doctor, heal thyself and, uh, found that I went through a very similar journey, went into withdrawal, literal, physical withdrawal from romance novels, made it the month that I recommend that for that dopamine fast felt better, thought I'm good now. Uh, I'm going to go back to reading in moderation binged. So had what's called the abstinence violation effect where I immediately like just lo a lost weekend, and um, then I was like, whoops, I guess that's not going to work. I'm not going to be able to moderate. So then I committed to a year of abstinence, which I was able to achieve. And yeah, that's kind of the story. I think, I think it's so important, Anna, that you do, that you're open about sharing this story because there's going to be loads of people that are listening to this and they've probably got something that, you know, isn't like a really considered a really serious addiction, like heroin or something. And they're probably scared to tell others about it because people are going to go, that's not an addiction. Don't be stupid or whatever, but it can literally happen to almost any behavior, yeah. you know? So mm -hmm. it's like, it's so important to be open about these things because it frees other people to actually maybe seek help for something that they're maybe a bit worried about share sharing with others. And then 
I've heard you say in another interview about, I think it was the four C's. Could you, could you tell us about those areas? I think that is important to cover too. Sure. So that's basically a way to condense the DSM or Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders criteria for addiction uh, into a, you know, a mnemonic that's easy to remember um, because there are 11 criteria and they're very wordy and hard to remember. So the four C's are the things to look for. Um, if you're thinking you might be getting addicted or someone you love is getting addicted and they are control, compulsion, craving, and consequences. And I don't, don't really require explanation. Sometimes compulsion requires explanation. It means a level of automaticity uh, to the behavior, uh, you know, the plan not to initiate the behavior, but then finding that you're initiating it unconsciously and unprovoked. Mm -hmm. um, control is just what it sounds like where typically once you initiate the behavior, you are not able to limit your consumption. You said, I, I said to myself, I'm just going to read one more chapter. And then there I was, you know, at the end of the book, five hours later, um, you know, or whatever it is. Craving is like the physiologic uh, intense desire to use that can really overwhelm people. I've had people with food addictions describe walking into a break room and seeing donuts there for folks and just breaking into a sweat and having had a patient who, whenever he drove by um, a massage parlor and that was his drug, um, you know, he would get stomach cramps. And those are really hard because what our brain, it's basically our brain trying to tell us, go get that thing, right? And using this very effective method of physical and psychological pain to get us to do that. If we wait it out, it goes away, but it's hard to resist in the moment because our brains then tell us a story. The only way you're going to feel better is if you use now. And then um, consequences is really the sine qua non of addiction where we, we begin to have all kinds of ramifications, health, relationship, professional. And then I always like to emphasize the subtle psychological impact of compulsive overconsumption, which we often miss, which is anhedonia or lack of joy or the narrowing of our ability to experience joy uh, in, in other more modest rewards and this focus on just this one thing. And then in addition to those four Cs, there are the WTFs, which is uh, W is withdrawal and T is tolerance. Tolerance means needing more potent forms over time. In other words, because of neuroadaptation, neuroadapt our drug essentially stops working and then we need more of it or we need a more potent form or we need a, a more rapid delivery mechanism. And that happened to me as I progressed from, you know, Twilight Saga to Fifty Shades of Grey or some equivalent like that. The F of WTFs doesn't mean anything. It just means WTF. <laughs> what happened here? How did I get here? <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, when I first heard you talk about the four C's, it made me realize that there's a there's a deeper problem here, and I do, I don't I don't know how deep it actually goes. I think I don't know if it's a societal problem or whatever, but it seems that we are almost a lot of us at least are living our lives on a kind of like a contingency and reward basis, where we're always kind of looking for the reward for a behavior. You know, we we exercise so we can enjoy the food after, or we you know we work hard so that we we get the thing at the end. And it seems to be that might be, I don't know if that's a cultural thing or whatever, but I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. And the thing that sort of sprung to mind whenever I kind of realized that I was like, you know, what if the reward that you were aiming for, like, what if it was your priority, just your state of being on a, you know, what if it was just like a calm, centered, content state of being on an ongoing basis? Like that should be the thing that we're it'd be aiming for, you know, what are yeah, your, what that's are your beautiful. Thoughts, I love that. Yeah. I mean, so this is, um, it is part of the human condition, you know, that we are strivers because it is our striving that has allowed us to survive, you know, in, in a, in a world of scarcity and ever present danger for so many millions of years, but it is that built in, uh, striving that is also the source of our suffering. And this is essentially, you know, sort of the Eastern philosophies and especially various forms of Buddhism have identified this as the central problem, you know, thousands of years ago, you know, described as, as clinging, um, you know, clinging to uh, wanting pleasure or even clinging to pain, but it's that attachment and that clinging and that 
for us to really be free and to be joyful and to flourish in our lives, we have to stop the striving and the clinging and find that, that place. But, um, what I would argue, I mean, I, and I agree with that, and I think it's a beautiful thing if you can get there, but I would say that we are living now in, in really an unprecedented time of access to reinforcing drugs and behaviors, and we're so insulated from pain and physical experience and being in our bodies that even you know Buddha's kind of middle way between... Uh, these two extremes um, no longer necessarily serves us, that we actually have to intentionally seek out pain and discomfort and intentionally create barriers between ourselves and these consumptive pleasures in order to make it. Because of the truth of the matter is the way that we're wired, once we are offered you know, uh, an intoxicant, and now they come in every single form, even our food, you know, our basic food is sugar, salt, and fat, you can't get away from it, unless you make an effort. Um, it's very hard to press the pause button between desire and consumption. I mean, we're, we're just, we're animals, right? And we're, and that's, it's very hard to resist once we're offered. So instead, what we have to do is create these literal and metacognitive barriers between ourselves and our drug of choice. We have to get those things out of the house. We have to create narratives that talk about the virtue of abstinence and restraint and not consuming and doing things that are hard. Um, in order to get to the place that you're talking about, that, that middle path, because we're so constantly bombarded by dopamine, by offers of dopamine, offers of drugs, because it chases us down, because these screens are in and of themselves reinforcing our portal to all kinds of you know, uh, digital uh, intoxicants. So, I mean, this idea of sort of, yeah, what, what is the good life? What, what should we, I mean, I think humans have essentially been talking about this and you know hit on these kind of universal truths. And so there's nothing new that I'm saying there, you know, except the new piece is uh, you know, a recognition that the world that we live in now, you know, what is sometimes referred to as the Anthropocene, the which is the first human era in which humans have changed the environment. So our actions have changed the world that we live in. And the classic example of that is global warming. But I think this kind of um, dopamine overload um, or overabundance is a, a parallel example of the Anthropocene. And we haven't figured out how to navigate that, right? Because we are going to die. I mean, we are dying because of overconsumption. 70% of uh, global deaths are due to diseases caused by modifiable risk factors. And the top three are smoking, inactivity, and diet slash obesity. There are more people in the world today who are obese than who are underweight. That is unprecedented in human history. We are at a point now where we have to actually change our anatomy in wealthy countries uh, in order for people to lose weight, right? So this is, I mean, this is like, a, we've clearly reached some kind of tipping point. And so I think because of that, uh, we need to look at the age-old wisdom in, in Buddhism and also in many religious traditions who have, which have traditions of fasting and restraint and abstinence and, and these are values and kind of try to see if we can um, modernize those ideas for the modern world. Makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Um, I, in our last conversation, you talked about, you know, one of the first things that you do most mornings, maybe it's every morning, I don't know, you, you do a workout. And that, it seems that you're sort of tilting the, the balance and the side of pain so that you can enjoy most of the day after. And yeah. I think that's such a simple thing, but that could make a huge difference to anybody's life, you know? Yeah. And, you know, what I, what I, you know, when we say workout, I mean, you know, people may be envisioning me doing something really, rig you know, vigorous, or but really it's just forcing myself to get out of bed and go on a walk. That, that's all it is, you know, a sustained um, in effortful, you know, physical activity, not too intense, you know, because I'm older. Um, but, uh, but it's the steadiness of it. It's the timing of it. You know, it's really, really important. A younger person like you, I know you're a runner, so you can do a lot more and you should 
should do more and enjoy it while, you know, your body is young and you can do those things. But I have so many patients who don't even leave their homes, who don't get up off the couch, um, you know, who can barely at this point even press the buttons on the remote control or, you know, manage to lift their laptop. I mean, it's just the, the place that we've arrived is really so far from, um, you know, how we evolved, you know, in nature. So we have to, this is very fundamental for our patients. And I think if they understand why we're asking them to do things that are hard and how it can reset their pleasure pain pathway, I think that might create the motivation. Just a quick break here to tell you about an exciting new membership we're developing, and then we'll get right back to the show. This gets you access to our mastered library of over five years of psychology conferences, including over 230 talks and interviews with the world's leading psychologists, professors, and authors, unlimited CPD certification, transcripts, quizzes, premium passes for our annual conference, online courses with Richard Schwartz and Deb Dana, and more. The cost is £97 for one year, which breaks down at around 27 p per day. The best bit is you can try it out for 30 days completely risk-free as all orders come with a 100% money-back guarantee. If you're interested, please go to twumembers.com for more information. And just, just to really sort of bring this home, I love the metaphor you use in the book of gremlins. Maybe if you could just tell us about gremlins and how that can help illustrate how dopamine works in the brain, just so people really understand what's, what's going on here. Sure. So a kind of metaphor for uh, the neuroscience on how we process pleasure and pain is imagine that in your part of the brain called the reward pathway, there's a balance like a teeter totter in a kid's playground. And that balance represents how we process pleasure and pain. When we experience pleasure, balance tips one way. And when we experience pain, it tips the other. So they're opposite sides of the same balance. And there are certain rules governing that balance. And the most important rule is that that balance wants to remain level. It doesn't want to be tipped for very long to either side. And with any deviation from neutrality, our brains will work very hard to restore a level balance. Also keep in mind that the work to restore a level balance is a physiologic stressor, which also releases cortisol or adrenaline, our own endogenous uh, you know, stress fight or flight hormone. So every time you're causing a deviation from neutrality, you are by definition stressing the system. So when we do something that's pleasurable, for example, I eat a piece of chocolate, it releases a little bit of dopamine in my brain's reward pathway. I like chocolate and my balance tips to the side of pleasure, but no, no, no sooner has that happened than my brain's going to work to restore a level balance. And here's the key point. It does it by tilting the balance first an equal and opposite amount to the side of pain. That's the chocolate come down or that moment of wanting one more piece before going to the level position again. I like that to imagine that as these little neuroadaptation gremlins hopping on the pain side of the balance to bring it level again, but they like it on the balance. So they stay on until it's tilted in equal and opposite amount. We, and then they hop off, right? And then I'm level again. Now that seems relatively benign. Um, and then that, but if in that moment of wanting, you know, uh, if I don't wait and in that moment of wanting another piece of chocolate, and I have a great big box there of chocolate because chocolate is very ubiquitous and cheap. I might not wait for the gremlins to hop off, right? For my balance to be restored. I might have another piece of chocolate, in which case I'll get another little hit of dopamine and I'll go, yay, I'm back on the pleasure side. But then I have two gremlins hopping off this time. And then they're tilting me to the side of pain and the come down. And what happens over time with repeated exposures is you essentially end up with enough gremlins on the pain side of the balance to fill this whole room and they're camped out there, which is to say, once they've established you know, their presence, they don't go away easily or quickly. With enough brain plasticity and enough abstinence from our drug, they will eventually hop off and homeostasis will be restored, but it can take, I can tell you a very long time to do that, especially, you know, in cases of people using very addictive drugs over long periods. And which is why people relapse, you know, and when we often wonder like, why would this person was doing so well, they stopped using, they got their job back. Why would they relapse? It's often because they're walking around with balance tilted to the side of pain. Those gremlins are still there. They're in a dopamine deficit state. And then they need to use not to get high, but really just to feel normal 
and reassert homeostasis. And when they're not using, they're experiencing the universal symptoms of withdrawal from any addictive substance, which are anxiety, irritability, insomnia, dysphoria, and craving. So this is really key because our patients will come in and say, I have terrible anxiety. Can you help me with that? Uh, what have you tried? The only thing that works for me is smoking pot. Well, I can validate that smoking pot probably temporarily restores a level balance. And so it feels like it relieves anxiety for that person. But in fact, what it's doing is actually contributing to more of a dopamine deficit state, more gremlins hopping on the pain side of the balance and actually causing or creating anxiety in the long run. So this is the key piece to communicate to our patients that what feels like self-medication is actually just medicating withdrawal from the last dose. And what we really need to do to help them with their anxiety and depression is for them to abstain from that drug for long enough to restore homeostasis or baseline levels of firing. And then the corollary to all of this is that the gremlins are agnostic to whatever the initial stimulus is. So if the initial stimulus is pleasure, they will hop on the pain side of the balance as a way to restore homeostasis. But if the initial stimulus is pain, for example, exercise, ice cold water, um, martial arts, you know, something that requires effortful engagement, then they will happily hop on the pleasure side of the balance and with repeated exposures, uh, essentially tilt our hedonic set point to the side of pleasure, which is really important, you know, information because that, that means that through inviting painful or uncomfortable things in our lives, we can actually improve our mood and sense of well-being over the long run. And this is called the science of hormesis. Hormesis is Greek for to set in motion. And essentially what we're doing is we're exposing our body to mild to moderate forms of noxious stimuli or toxic, uh, not toxic insult. And, and exercise is in fact toxic to cells. Um, but what, what happens is that we then trigger our body's own healing mechanisms to upregulate uh, production of dopamine and other feel-good neurotransmitters. So that's a much better and more enduring way to get dopamine. The cautionary piece there is you can get addicted to pain. And so you don't want to take it too far. Uh, cutting, for example, releases a flood of endogenous, endogenous opioids. That's why people do it. Um, but it, we can develop tolerance very quickly to that. And so when you talking about extreme forms of pain that release a lot of um, endogenous neurotransmitters or opioids all at once, you've essentially then, you're not doing hormesis. You, you've essentially turned pain into an intoxicant. So that you want to avoid. But the slow, moderate exposure on a regular basis to things that are hard is a really good way to reset our pleasure pain balance to the side of pleasure. 100%. And I remember um, I heard it in your book, but I also heard it from Andrew Huberman, who you've done a really good interview with. Um, uh, cold water exposure can increase dopamine by two and a half times above baseline, you know, and not only that, it lasts for something is it like hours after as well. Yeah, three to four hours afterwards. Yeah, that's really key because unlike with intoxicants where you get a sudden spike, but then a plummeting of dopamine levels below baseline in that craving or dopamine deficit state. What happens with cold water is at first, you know, the body, it's an injury or an insult, uh, but then the body goes, oh, a better, you know, work and go into protective mode here. So you see a gradual increase over the course of the ice cold water exposure itself. And then those levels of do elevated dopamine remain, remain elevated for hours afterwards before going back down to baseline. So essentially what you're doing is you're paying for your dopamine upfront and you're controlling that payment uh, rather than getting the dopamine like on loan and then having to pay uh, with interest afterward. The other really cool thing about uh, ice, ice cold freezing temperatures is that we are born with the most neurons we'll ever have in our lives. And our brains go through a process of pruning back or cutting back those neurons through age 25 uh, so that we're left with the scaffolding that we'll use in our adult life, which is why those years are so important in terms of developing healthy and adaptive coping strategies. We used to think that you never made new neurons, but in the last 50 to 75 years, another exciting a neuroscientific finding is that there's actually neurogenesis or the creation of new neurons throughout life. 
uh, even into older age, it, it lessens, but it's still there, which is, you know, we can feel optimistic about that. It enhances our plasticity. And there are some very clear indicators of what promotes neurogenesis. And the two top on the list in animal studies is exercise and freezing cold temperatures. Uh, so it's, you know, those are, those are some putative mechanisms also whereby those are uh, healthy behaviors. It's probably why Wim Hof is making such big waves in the world. Um, yeah. These days. yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, I think it's something as well, you know, whenever people think about dopamine, they just think like, think dopamine hits, they, th they immediately just think pleasure. And this is what I thought for mm -hmm. a long time, but it seems that this, this is also plays a massive role in motivation and how motivated we are to get up and live and move and pursue things as well. So I'm just curious, you know, if for anybody that's working as a, as a therapist or a helping professional of any kind, like it's important, that seems like that, you know, it's really important to understand how this works. Um, in terms of, you know, you, your, your perspective on this, what do you, do you draw a distinction between healthy and unhealthy forms of motivation? And I, I've heard you say before, Anna, about, um, you know, you speak to medical students now and, you know, in the past people were very happy you know, to, to be a doctor, you know, to be a doctor or to pursue one sort of pathway. But now you, you'll speak to medical students and they'll tell you, I want to be a doctor, but I want to start a startup and I want to do this. And it's like, I think we're way, maybe we're over ambitious and this causes us a lot of issues in the modern world. What, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think that, I mean, I really feel, sorry, I feel badly for young people today because their benchmark for a successful life has been adulterated essentially by social media. So social media, you know, is a, is a way that human connection has become drugified. There are positive things. So let's just leave that. Yes, there are wonderful positive things about it, but, you know, people can clearly get addicted to social media. They're engineered intentionally to be addictive and be reinforcing. Um, you know, the AI makes them so in all the different ways that people have heard about. But I think the other way in which social media is really, um, in, you know, in, in sort of dangerous and harmful is that it is very natural and human to compare ourselves to other people. It's one of the ways that we fit ourselves into the you know, social hierarchy. We're, we're wired to do that. How am I the same as this person? How am I different? But again, for most of human existence, you existed in a, in a family and in a village um, or even a larger group, you know, even when you know, my my youth, where the comparisons were essentially between yourself and your siblings and your neighbors and the people at your school. But now young people are comparing themselves to millions and millions of people all over the world. And many of those online images are curated. You don't see the bad stuff. You just see these people's amazing accomplishments. And the result is a kind of learned helplessness where people end up feeling, well, well, like I could never do that, you know, so I'm just going to give up trying, or I have to be so ambitious and accomplish so much in order to, you know, be worth anything at all. And so it's a, it's a also then a repetitive cycle of just feeling less than, or feeling like you're behind, or feeling like you're missing out, or feeling like, well, I'm doing this here, but I should be over there. And it's, it's really, really hard, you know? Um, and I just, I think just recognizing that that's true um, and kind of stealing ourselves around the way, well, wait a minute, you know, this, let me, let me recalibrate here. Uh, and I think getting back to things like values is really important. Like, what do I really care about? Um, narrowing it down to the scope of a single day, what makes for a good day and a bad day? Why was yesterday a good day and the day before it not so good? You know, what can I do to optimize my days? What can I do to not so much think about these grandiose goals, um, but rather what, what, you know, what is sort of where am I right now? And what is the work that I've been given or what, what is uh, something that I could do in my world right now today to make it a little bit better. So, so really bringing it way back down, you know, uh, instead of it being the universe of possibilities, uh, just like what, what are the actual practical possibilities today for me and sort of approaching every day that way. 
And that's also wisdom from AA and recovery. You know, one of their famous mantras is one day at a time. Taking things one day at a time is really powerful because if you have a string of good days, that's a string of good weeks and a string of good weeks is a string of good months. So, and it's really, and it's, you don't know exactly where it's all going to lead, but you can feel pretty confident that a good day and a string of good days will lead you to a good place. So you have to think about, well, what are, what are the things I care about? What are my values? What is a good day? How would I, if I just had one, if I just had today, you know, what would that day look like? What would be a good day for me? I, I, I did a, one day isn't enough time to win the Nobel prize or write the great American novel or start, you know, Facebook or some, it's not enough time to do that. So what can I do today? If I only have today, well, I can, I can get up and I can, you know, give my mom a hug and say, good morning. Um, and I can, you know, put the dishes away and, uh, you know, I can, I ride my bike to school instead of walking and I can uh, pay attention in class, you know, and be respectful to this, this teacher who showed up and planned this lesson. And um, I can help somebody else who's not understanding, you know, and it, it's almost magical how a good day like that can lead to a really amazing place that you volitionally chose and contributed to. And yet on some very profound level, is sort of out of your hands too. You're sort of in the flow of not your flow, but the flow of the world uh, in, you know, it going to good places. I love that. I love that. Um, it kind of reminded me of, so we interviewed another guy for the summit, a guy called Alfred Langla, and mm. he was a, a direct mentee of Viktor Frankl. And one oh, of things, great. Yeah. One of the things that Alfred sort of said in that is like, you know, in, in any moment or in any day, everybody is presented with a, a range of possibilities about what they, right. how they could spend their time. And it's like the first sort of step towards like, you know, experiencing meaning is to know what those possibilities are and then to choose whatever, whatever option would provide the most meaning or the most would, you know, whatever. And the situation after that interview, like, I think that was like the next day or something. I was like, I had an open evening and I was dry. I was just driving, I think I was like coming back from the gym or something. And I was like, so I've got a range of options about how I could spend my time here. And then I thought, well, I haven't seen my, my, my grand, my granny in a while. So I was like, I'll go around and see my granny. That would be feel very meaningful. And it was, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. it's just like becoming conscious of what's, what the possibilities are. Can Yeah. I love that. And, you know, in that moment of choice, you know, this speaks to a little bit what I talk about in dopamine nation. Sometimes it's hard to know what to choose, you know, what is the thing to choose and, and what I suggest is that the, the, when, you, when you really don't know, if you choose the thing that's harder to do, that's probably the right thing. And so I think bringing that back a little bit to like, not the comfortable path, but the path with a little bit of friction um, is, I mean, because it was probably would have been a lot easier for you to go home and watch, watch Netflix than to go, you know, go and see granny, right? The, the uncertainty of that, all of the things that go along with with that but but you did it and it sounds like it was really uh you you knew it was the right choice yeah 100 percent. i think we all can have that sense um but as well so there, there's a couple of things i'd like to sort of maybe ask you about um i i've heard from another we've interviewed another guy i don't know if you're aware of his work or, or not you might be very interested in, in maybe speaking to this person if not he's a guy called mark lewis from the university of toronto um He's read a couple of really good books on addiction. It's called Memoirs of an Addicted Brain. You two would have an amazing conversation, I think. Um, but he, he was saying that addicts would, um, they have no time horizon. Their right. focus is the just that day. And all they can think about is, you know, the, that day. And they can't think beyond that. And it seems that, people that have the, and in your book as well, you talk about opioid, opioid addicts, I think are people that are addicted to opioids and they compare that with people that are with healthy controls and opioid addicts could only think about very short-term things, whereas healthy controls could think across longer time spans. So I'm wondering for people working with addiction, can strengthening their sort of connection to their future self almost, or widening their time horizon, can that be something that 
benefits people that that struggle with addiction. Yeah, right. So, so good. I want to reconcile those some kind of paradox that your question raises with what I said before about, you know, taking it one day at a time. How can that be good if now we're saying that people with addiction, that's all they do is this, but it, it, with people with addiction, they're, what they're doing is they're really just focusing on getting their reward. There's, there's, they're not really focusing on living a day. Um, they're just focusing on the next, you know, drug, which is different from, from, but yeah, those temporal horizons shrink as people become focused in that way in, in, in that they're not really able to appreciate future consequences of current consumption. But absolutely, one of the clinical interventions, which I actually describe in the book, uh, to motivate somebody to try a dopamine fast, which is this 30 days of um, going without their drug of choice, knowing that they'll feel worse before they feel better because they'll go into withdrawal before the neuroadaptation gremlins hop off and homeostasis is restored. But you know, initially I will get quite a bit of resistance uh, to doing that. And one of the ways to, to sort of invite people into being more willing to try a dopamine fast is to say to them, well, okay, um, the way that you're using your drug now, do you still plan to be using it that way in 10 years? And usually the answer is no. Usually it's like, well, I'm just doing this now because of this and that and this and that. But you know, 10 years from now, I'm going to be in a very different place. So, okay. So you're able to project yourself in the future 10 years from now and say, I, I don't want to be using my drug in this way 10 years from now. I will have moved on. Then, then you basically just bring it, the, the goalposts for closer and closer. You say, well, how about five years from now? No, don't want to, you know, don't want to be. How about two years from now? And then all of a sudden, once you're talking about a year or two, then they really have to look at, all right, well, if I am going, if I do want to change this behavior, when am I going to do it? And if I'm willing to do it a year from now, why not right now? And, and that can be a really good, good way to get people to think, to think more broadly. And I essentially learned that from a patient of mine who got really addicted to opioids and ended, ended up dealing opioids, um, you know, using heroin, really essentially snorting it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And he got to a year of that and it was that year anniversary uh, that got him thinking existentially about his time on earth and his life narrative. And he said to himself, well, I'm doing this. I've been doing this for a year now. And if I keep going after, after beyond a year, I may be doing this my whole life. And there was that moment that he thought, I don't, I don't want to live like that, you know, and that very day he, he went and he, he got help. So it, time is really, uh, uh, you know, an important construct and it can be a really invoking time can be a powerful tool. hundred percent, hundred percent. Well, and I've got about three pages of notes that we're not going to get through here, which I'm <laughs> absolutely gutted about, but uh, I think there'd be a couple of really good, maybe a good way to sort of wrap up. Um, I have two questions. I'm going to tell you about the first one. I don't want you to answer it now because I want to give you a bit of time to think about it, maybe in the background. And then the other question, so the, the first question is, you know, for a therapist or a mental health professional listening to this, um, we're asking all the speakers, if you could recommend three books that you think every mental health professional should read, um, maybe three books that have really impacted you or books that you've gifted most to others in your, in your profession. Um, so keep that in the back of your mind. And then the other question, just to, just to wrap up is, so, so the last chapter is around the lessons of the balance. And I think... Mm -hmm this really succinctly summarizes the kind of key takeaways from, from your work. So can you maybe take us through some of the lessons of the balance and then we can get into the books. Is that cool? Sure. Yeah. Gosh, I, the books one's going to be hard there. I, I, I sort of hesitate to recommend even one book over another. There are so many, but maybe I can talk more broadly about some of the books I keep going back to. Um, uh, lessons of the balance. Yes. Yeah. So the lessons of the balance are, you know, first abstain, um, and then tolerate and become comfortable with the pain of withdrawal and, and the boredom. 30 days abstinence? Is that the... So 30 days is usually the average amount of time it takes to begin to restore reward pathways and to enjoy more modest rewards, to be able to have the insight to look back. So the first thing is to abstain, then to recognize that you'll, you will be you know, in withdrawal, it will be un uncomfortable. So learning to mindfully um, sit with that discomfort, to tolerate boredom, to become comfortable with not reaching for something to distract yourself or escape that suffering. Um, 
And so I'm not going to remember these exactly, the sort of off the top of my head, some of the key ones. Uh, then the other thing is um, to engage in what I call self-binding. This is putting barriers between ourselves and our drug of choice because um, you know, willpower is not an infinite resource and we need to be able to have a pause button and we're more likely to be able to abstain if it's harder to get our drug. So talk about different types of self-binding strategies. Um, then I talk about um, doing things intentionally that are hard in order to either maintain a homeostasis or even to get dopamine in a healthier and more adaptive way. So pressing on the pain side of the balance as a more enduring, indirect way to get more sustained sources of dopamine. And we talked about that. But there are other ways to do things that are hard. Another one is radical honesty, where we tell the truth about things large and small, um, which is hard to do because we're all natural liars. Uh, but that radical honesty does a lot of different things. As I, I talk about in the book, it probably certainly promotes real intimacy, which is its own healthy and adaptive source of dopamine. It also potentially stimulates the prefrontal cortex, which allows us to um, regulate our consumption and, and keep those gremlins in check. Um, and radical honesty is also a way to tell truthful autobiographical narratives, where, which are not just a way to organize past experience, but also provide a roadmap for the future. So being honest is really key for anybody trying to manage compulsive overconsumption or addiction. And then I also talk about pro-social shame and the role of, of shame in our lives and how shame can actually be a really good thing. We don't often talk about it that way, but if we didn't experience shame, uh, we would have no motivation to adhere to social norms and uh, you know belong to the tribe. So those are just some of the, the key things. Um, in terms of books, um, just to there's, interrupt, uh, there's uh, yeah. one, there's one you didn't get. You got the most. Oh, uh, yeah. What was it? It was the, the medication can restore homeostasis, but there's a cost, you know? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So, and, and for some people that is the way, you know, using medications, but it's just important to recognize the potential risks and downsides and what we, what we potentially lose in using medications as a way to restore homeostasis. So thank you for reminding me about that. Um, and then in terms of, uh, gosh, I, I really, there's a whole series of books looking at the intersection of Buddhism and psychotherapy. Um, one is called Going on Being. Um, the other is called Thoughts Without a Thinker. Um, they're by Mark Epstein. They're really wonderful books, beautifully written. I love them. Um, what else? Gosh, there, I'm looking over in my bookshelf, seeing what I have here. Um, I actually recommend reading uh, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Okay. Um, it's, you know, the stories are sort of dated. They sort of read like something out of the 1950s because they are out of the 1950s. <laughs> but it's, uh, they're, they're very powerful narratives and they really speak to um, addiction as a disease um, and how it can take over the brain. Oh, I've got to go. I've got somebody knocking on my door. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, well, maybe um, well, you could send me a bit email and I'll pass it on to people after. That the, sounds good. That sounds good. Anna, thanks so much for your time today. I've, I've loved every minute of this. And Oh, me too. It's always a, a joy to talk to you. Everybody get the book, Dopamine Nation. It's an, an amazing read and well worth checking out. So anyway, Anna, I'll let you go. All the best. Thank you. Take good care. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed the show. If you'd like to hear the full version, you can do so with the Weekend University Premium Membership. This gets you access to your mastered library of over five years of psychology conferences, including over 230 talks and interviews with the world's leading psychologists, professors, and authors, unlimited CPD certification, transcripts, quizzes, premium passes for our annual conference, online courses with Richard Schwartz and Deb Dana, and more. The cost is £97 for one year, which breaks down at around 27p per day. The best bit is you can try it out for 30 days completely risk-free as all orders come with a 100% money back guarantee. If you're interested, please go to twumembers.com for more information.